So in this video, I'm going to go over um, a very popular and very influential scheduling algorithm for um, high-level synthesis, and it's been implemented in the open source high-level synthesis system that I'm uh, using in these videos, a demo HLS system that's available on GitHub at my GitHub DHLS. And Basically, the scheduling algorithm I'm going to talk about it was uh, originally published by a guy named Zhang. It's Zhang's um, SDC scheduling algorithm, where SDC stands for System of Difference Constraints. And I'm going to assume you've watched the last video where I kind of overview um, a high-level synthesis program and show how to synthesize a very simple single-store construction program. Uh, so let's look at that, uh, that test case from the last video, the scheduling a single-store operation. Let's just run the case. So really what I'm going to go over today is just this portion of the code, um, what the scheduler for uh, SD for um, a high-level synthesis system does. And really the job of the scheduler is to take an LLVM function, which we've loaded here, or a function in some other, you know, I'm using LLVM, it could be some other compiler intermediate representation, and to, to take in also some hardware constraints and to convert those hardware constraints in that function uh, basically into a finite state machine that executes the original program. So to actually understand how this works, let's, uh, well, let's take a look at the output. Let's go back up and uh, rerun the test just one more time, and let's look at the output of the test. So to refresh ourselves, um, the function that we're scheduling is this function single store, and it consists of two instructions, a store instruction where we store the value 5 to the thing pointed to by A, where A is... Uh, the first argument of the function, and then we return, and return is going to basically send a valid signal uh, of this uh, generated module for this function to be high and signal the end of uh, execution of the module. So let's just, um, well, first of all, take a look at what the schedule function does. So if we go into source scheduling, schedule function, and there's a bunch of different variants of it here. Uh, yeah, here's the basic one. And really all we're doing this scheduling um, is implementing the Zhang SDC scheduling algorithm. Um, and basically what the Zhang algorithm does is it translates the data and control dependencies in the original program into a bunch of programming, uh, well, basically integer programming constraints, linear integer programming constraints and then translates the resource constraints in the program into uh, also linear constraints and then solves them. And actually the linear constraints that it generates are so simple that they fall into an easy to solve, and by that I mean polynomial time solvable subset of the integer linear programming called, um, oh, that to do is actually out of date. I've done that, um, which is called uh, difference logic and which can actually be solved in polynomial time. Sorry, I got distracted there. So um, this is actually the code. It's kind of, I don't want to go over the code in detail because it's a bit of a mess. Let's just look at some of the relevant outputs. So the first thing we're going to do is look at um, all of the different variables in the generated integer linear program that represents the schedule for this two instruction program. And actually that's printed out down here under solver constraints. So in the solver constraints, there's sort of two segments. This is the whole thing, and it's printed out in this what's called SMT notation. And um, this is just a standard way of writing out um, constraints that go into SMT solvers, which um, we're using an SMT solver to solve this problem, and so it prints them out this way. So there's two segments. There's declare fun and assert, and you can read declare fun um, as declare variable. So these are all of the variables in our uh, basically optimization or uh, SAT problem that we're going to solve in order to get a schedule. Sorry, I had to take a drink of water. So this program has one basic block, right? There's no control flow. It just enters the program, stores a value, and then returns. So there's a single basic block. And for that basic block, we have two very integer variables, the basic block start state and the basic block end state. And as the name suggests, these represent the integer values that are going to get assigned to these variables by the solver are going to represent the states in which the basic block starts and ends. And in this case, because there's only one basic block in the program, that's going to represent actually the time at which the program starts and ends. Now for the return instruction and the store instruction, there's one scheduling variable for the return, ret110. And then there's actually four scheduling variables for the store variable. And if you notice there's store 100, then store 101, then store 102, and store 103. 
And the fact that there's one for return and four for store is not a coincidence. So if we go back to the setup of the test, notice that we said that the latency of the store operation is three. So it takes three cycles for the store to complete. So the variable store 100 represents the initiation of the store, the cycle or the clock period in which we set the inputs to the memory we're storing to. Then store 101 is going to be the cycle after that. Store 102 is going to be the cycle after that, so it's going to be two clock cycles after the initiation uh, of or at the setting of the store memory's ports. And then store 13 is going to represent the first clock period at which the store has actually completed, so the first period at which the system sees the effects of the store. Um, and so basically, in general, uh, if the latency of an operation is n, the number of scheduling variables in the generated problem is n plus 1. So the return instruction is just setting a port to be high on the output of the module. So it's a combinational operation that completes in zero cycles. So it has 0 plus 1 equal to 1 variables, which represent the cycle in which the return instruction is executed. Okay, so now let's take a look at the constraints. So a lot of these constraints are just kind of boilerplate because when you feed when you try to phrase a problem like this to a constraint solver, you had to have to add in a lot of really basic stuff just to make sure the constraint solver doesn't do something crazy. So the first constraint is really just saying that the basic block starts before or at time zero. Um, so basically, the basic block doesn't start before the beginning of time. Um, and then we've got uh, that the basic block end state is greater than or equal to the basic block start state, which just means that the basic block doesn't end at least until the cycle where the basic block starts, right? So if the basic block is tiny and only contains combinational operations, we might schedule the entire basic block in a single state, and the end state and the start state might be equal to one another, or the end state might be after the start state. Um, then we've got this instruction, which is constraint on when return executes. So return is the terminator instruction for the basic block that contains it. It's the last instruction in its basic block and actually the last instruction in the program. And as a result of that, um, the return instruction has to execute by definition at the basic block end state because the end of the basic block is by definition the time when the return executes. Then we have two constraints for the relationship between the execution time of the store variable and the basic block um, execution times. And these are really just saying that the store has to, so store, the zeroth store variable has to start at least at the cycle where the basic block starts. And the store has to end inside the basic block that contains it. So basically, these two constraints are just saying the store has to happen in the basic block that contains it. And actually, even though it's redundant, we have constraints that say that the return has to happen in the basic block that contains it, even though actually we could optimize that away because the basic block actually has to uh, end by definition at the time when the return ends. So then we have a bunch of constraints on the interior variables in, or the um, sort of variables that represent different stages of the store. So um, store 101 has to be the cycle immediately after the store starts, right? And then store 102 has to be the cycle immediately after that, and then store 103 has to be the cycle immediately after that. So what we're going to do is basically feed these constraints into the SMT solver, and the SMT solver is going to give us a solution, and the solution is actually printed out here as the final model. And the printout um, well, it's, again, just a Lisp-style printout where it uses define fun, and you can read that as define variable. And um, so what we're going to basically say is, well, let's look at the basic blocks first. We're going to say we start at basic block, uh, basic block starts at time 0, basic block ends at time 3, and we're going to say at time 0, we're going to start the store, and then the store is going to go from time 0 to time 1 to time 2, and then to time 3. And then we're going to say, because this variable, by definition, is the first state of the finite state machine or clock period of the generated hardware in which the store is completed, we're going to say as soon as we get to the state 3, we're going to do the return, right? Because this is, by definition, the first state uh, at which the result of the store is visible. And uh, here's actually just a cleaner printout of that that I've done that takes away the Lisp syntax. So that's how, um, that's actually a very primitive representation of a finite state machine. And the next step where we build the state transition graph is going to be to convert the solution of this integer programming problem into an explicit finite state machine that describes the custom hardware that we're going to create. And I'm going to talk about that in another video.